daughter's excited to be here. <laughs> it is so good to see all of you this morning. I want to introduce a, a little video. If you have uh, been in the Church of the Nazarene for more than 15 years, raise your hand. Okay? So all of you probably know what alabaster is. So we're going to raise the most alabaster offering. And we give money, a collect change, every year above our tithe, uh, in little boxes. And we bring it all month long. And alabaster offering goes to do some really cool things. So I want you to just take a, a second and watch this video. We give to missions all year long. We have missionaries all over the world in over 150 different countries in our denomination. The alabaster offering that we do twice a year uh, goes specifically towards, as the video said, buildings, hospitals, schools, housing, and churches. So this is kind of above and beyond our missional giving that we do as a, as a church every year in our budgets that we do. So we want to remind you that this whole month, you can take an alabaster box. There's lunch right by the door as you leave the sanctuary. And there's one great big one that will be there all, all month. And as you come back each week, bring your box full of change. You can dump it in that box. And uh, we'll report to you at the end of the month the offering that is going towards building these buildings. Now, this is really uh, special to me because at the end of April, I'll be going to India and Nepal in order to train some pastors in that part of the world. And I will get to see firsthand some of those buildings that have been built with alabaster money. Churches, hospitals, schools, orphanages, all those things. So as we go through this month, I just invite you to collect change, to go above and beyond your regular tithe, so that God's good work can be seen all around this globe, that these buildings can be built. Uh, I want to ask the ushers to come and prepare to receive our regular tithe this morning. And as they come, I would just like you to pray with me. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come into your house this morning. We thank you for the blessings that you've been giving us. We thank you, God, for how great you are. And we come as part of our act of worship to bring our tithe into your storehouse. And we ask, God, that you would take it from our hands, that you would multiply it in ways that we cannot imagine, that your will would be done, Father, that your will would be done. Blessed as we give, God, and we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So, things a little different this morning because it's Super Bowl Sunday, or maybe not even because of that. Okay. If we had power, real power, we could have made it so the Seahawks were in the Super Bowl today, right? If my wife had her way, it would be the Cowboys. Okay, so Marty and Papa Dan, they'd rather have the Broncos. But we really don't have that power, do we? We can't go and you know, fix the outcome of a football game or whatever. But we do have some power to live out mission in God's great world, don't we? I, we're in red today because if you're part of our Facebook page, you saw maybe a little uh, flirting with disaster yesterday. When somebody posted, you know, church ought to be like football. And whenever the pastor makes a, a good point, you pour Gatorade on it. No. <laughs> and, and people were talking about whether it should be orange Gatorade or red Gatorade. I thought about typing in green because that's the Seahawk color. You know, I don't know if they've got blue Gatorade, but they probably do. You know? Angie said it should be red so that, you know, you don't notice the stains in the cart. <laughs> So I wore red, just in case. Okay. I even got my red preaching shoes on. So we have power to do what God calls us to do because he gives us that power, right? He enables us to live out mission. Uh, we are here talking about the temptations of Jesus and us the last week of this series. And I want to remind you that God has called us to encourage people to respond to the call that Jesus has on their life. That's the power that we have. We have the power to encourage one another. Even people that we don't know. That there is a God. He sent his son Jesus who loves us very much. And he wants us to have real life. Abundant life to the full. Amen? So we're going to start this year. We're going to get started doing something. We're going to start where we are. 
We're not going to dream up dreams of maybe by September or, or the fall sometime, I might be ready to actually start doing something then. We're going to start right now, right where we're at. We're going to use what we have, the stuff that God has already blessed us with. I bet every single one of you has stuff that God could use to share the gospel. It could be a couch. It could be a sweatshirt. It could be a car. It could just be a meal, a water bottle. It doesn't matter what it is. God can use what you have because he gave it to you. So we're going to use what we have, and we're going to do what we can. We're not going to just sit idly by. We're going to do what we can. We're going to do what God tells us to do, what he calls us to do. And we're going to let him do the stuff that we can't. Okay? We're going to do what we can, and we're going to let God do what he does. Amen? Amen. There we go. So, this past couple weeks we've been talking about the struggle with being relevant and spectacular. And that struggle is real today, isn't it? The struggle of the temptation to be relevant to the world, to be spectacular, to draw attention. Uh, and then Jesus asks the question, do you love me? And if we say, yes, we love Jesus, what are we to do? We're to feed his sheep. So if Jesus says, when you face temptation to be relevant and spectacular, here's my question to you. Do you love me? We say, yes, we do. Then feed my sheep. It's very simple. We don't have to be relevant to the world. We don't have to be spectacular. Jesus just asks us to take care of the kids. But I don't mean kids. I mean all of us. We're all kids of king, right? So Jesus says, feed my sheep. I want you to... Name a place in your life, a place where you feel in control. Somebody tell me, just shout it out. A place where you feel in control and safe. Home. Tony says home. Somebody else. Driving. I'm sorry? Driving. Driving. In your own car. You've got the music blaring, whatever you want to listen to, right? A place where you feel in control and safe. Somebody else. <laughs> Your own little room. You know, you can shut the door and shut the world out, and it can just be you, right? A place where you feel in control, a place where you feel safe. Now, I want you now to name a situation or a place where you feel out of control. Somebody. Tell When you get in trouble. That's often. She's out of control all the time. <laughs> Somebody else, a place to bed? Having surgery. Oh, when you're in the hospital, you know, and you're having a procedure done, and you just, you know, you don't know what the outcome's going to be. Somebody else, a place that you feel out of control, Mark? Sometimes when I'm around in my own side. Okay, that's not safe, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's not in my control when people don't want my we talked about that before, you know, we get on our bike or we are in our car, it's really easy to lose our sanctification. I mean, you're kind of frustrated with people on the road. So maybe a place you would feel uh, unsafe or maybe out of control types would be in a vehicle or at a hospital when we're in trouble being disappointed by our parents. The places where we feel safe and control feel that way because we, in a very real sense, have power over that situation. And power feels good, doesn't it? Come on. Yes. Power feels good, doesn't it? Authority feels good, doesn't it? It feels good to be in control, right? Here's a little secret. Whatever control. Ever. But it sure does feel good when it seems like we're in control, doesn't it? Yes. It's when you're at home. That was that first <coughs> answer that, that Tony gave. When you're at home, you're the king of the castle. You can change the channel to whatever you want. <laughs> you see all the guys shaking their head no? What is up with that? So it's not the king of the castle, it's the queen of the castle that changes the control. <laughs> you, you can walk around in your PJs all day if you want to. You can sit on the couch, you don't even got to get up. I got my wife for Christmas a heated throw blanket. Some of you would say, what's a heated throw blanket? Well, that's an electric blanket for your bed, but it's only one person, and it goes on the couch. <laughs> so that your husband doesn't 
you don't have a heart attack when the power bill comes because the heater's cranked up all the time. <laughs> she feels nice and toasty warm. She can put the temperature on whatever she wants with the heated throat. You know, it's like I can eat ice cream for breakfast if I wanted to because that's my safe place, right? That's the place where I get to make some decisions, right? That's the place where I have some power unless it's the remote control for the TV, apparently. <laughs> but when we get out in the real world, there are temptations about power, uh, and those temptations can be quite overwhelming. The, the temptation to control situations, to control the world around us, it's quite alluring, isn't it? To have power over a, a workplace or a school classroom or, or any of those things. If you're a teacher, you know what I'm talking about. Students that think they have power over the classroom and that they can just do whatever they want and they can pull the other kids aside. That's my son. That's my son sometimes. It's quite alluring. That's why it's called temptation, right? The temptation of power. Power helps us to be relevant, and power can help us to be spectacular, and power can shine a light on us and help us to feel oh so good about ourselves. Maybe this is why this temptation is the last in line with Satan, because the temptation of power is so, well, powerful, isn't it? I want you to stand with me. If you got your Bible or your phone or tablet or whatever, turn over to Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1. We're going to read through verse 11. Matthew chapter 4, starting at verse 1. And it's the God's Word we're reading up on the screen as well. It says this, Then the Spirit led Jesus up into the wilderness, so that the devil might tempt him. After Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was starving. The tempter came to him and said, Since you are God's son, command these stones to become bread. And Jesus replied, It's written, People won't live only by bread, but by every word spoken by God. After that, the devil brought him into the holy city and stood at the highest point of the temple. And he said to him, Since you are God's son, throw yourself down, for it is written, I will command my angels concerning you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. And Jesus replied again, it's written, don't test the Lord your God. Then the devil brought him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said, I'll give you all these if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus responded, go away, Satan, because it is written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil left him and the angels came and took care of him. Father God, we pray your blessing upon the reading of your word. May it permeate, uh, permeate us with your truth, God. May your Holy Spirit bless us and envelop us today as we talk about your word, God. And may you bless us and transform us into the image of your son, Jesus, that we might be your servants and sharers and spreaders of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Use us today, God, and have your way, and we pray it together, saying, Amen. You may be seated. So the third temptation of Jesus that he faces and that we face is power. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 9, we just read it. Satan says, I'll give you all these if you bow down and worship me. Power. Many people in our country are clamoring for a change in power, aren't they? See it on the news? Many people, they're, they're doing whatever it takes to grab on to power. When I was over in Seattle earlier this week on Thursday attending a, a funeral of a dear lady that I had the honor of having a relationship with, I was standing there after the funeral was over and, and waiting for the few people that had come with me that I was their ride and, and uh, they were saying their last goodbyes to some common friends and I went up to the car and 
I said my goodbyes and I checked my phone real quick. I had turned it off, you know. I checked it to see if I got any messages from my wife. I checked it to see uh, if anything was going on with the lives and people in my church that I attend on Facebook. And the very first thing that popped up on my Facebook feed was a video uh, from Portland, Oregon in an airport where a group of people that were standing outside the door protesting the immigration uh, things that the president has been doing. Uh, this gentleman had walked out the, the automatic doors of the airport from inside, and they just attacked him and started feeding him. And he ran back inside, and they followed him, a group of people, and they beat him until he was unconscious. Why? How? Because they wanted to? Because they felt like that guy maybe didn't agree with the things that they thought? How? Clamoring, control, seizing. We're seeing in so many places across the country right now, those striving, it's coming to the temptation of power, the illusion of power. Not just in the world do we see this, but the church too. In fact, if we look at the past few decades of the church, if we look at attendance and growth, decline, all the things that have been happening, uh, we often see that they are related in some sort of way to the temptation of power. Not always. I mean, God's growing his church, and he will, despite us sometimes. But sometimes growth is related to power. Sometimes decline is related to power. How are we tempted by power in the church? Somebody just tell me. How are we tempted, as, as a group of followers of Jesus, how are we tempted by power in the church? Nobody's tempted by power in the church, but Judging other people. Judging other people? I mean, think or believe differently than we do? Something else? Are we tempted by power in the church with finances? Maybe, you know, if that pastor up there doesn't start saying some things I agree with, I'm not starting to hold my money. Or if, if the programs that I think the church should have, if they don't start happening, I'll, I'll withhold my time, or I'll just stop attending, I'll pick up my family, we'll go someplace else. The allure of power. Maybe it is a power play, political power. You ever seen political power in the church before? You're all laughing, because we have. Maybe it is, you know, man, I've got some good ideas about this church, but nobody listened to me, so I've got to get on the board and make my ideas happen. And then people will follow me. You know? Power is a very tempting thing, isn't it? It isn't just the laity, though, that, that everyday people that go to the church that may withhold tithe or pick up their ball and go home or seek some political office within the church. <coughs> it is also within the leadership of the church at times. One of the uh, greatest ironies in the history of Christianity is that the leaders, pastors, priests, bishops, popes, doesn't matter, constantly gave and still give into the temptation of power, political power, <coughs> military power, economic power, even moral and spiritual power. We've seen kingdoms rise and fall because of the church. We've seen mass killings because of the church. I want you to think about it for a moment. Jesus, the Son of God, the guy who felt no need to exert his divine power in a way that he would have rightfully been justified to do, that guy instead emptied himself and became like us and he leads us and asks us to do the same. To become utterly irrelevant in a world that's clamoring for relevance. To be powerless in a world that is seeking so much power and authority. The rub and the irony is that the allure of power is so strong that in the name of Jesus, many of us consider power in one of its many shapes and forms, a good instrument for pro proclaiming the gospel. I want you to look at that statement. If you got your notes, write in the, the notes in that statement. The allure of power is so strong that in the name of Jesus, many followers of Christ 
would consider power a good tool for spreading the gospel. We have hundreds of years of examples of this, folks. Power, the temptation. The Crusades took place. Inquisitions were organized. Indians were enslaved and, and converted. Positions of great influence were desired. Cathedrals were built. And much moral manipulation of conscience was done. In the name of Jesus. The poor, humble, and irrelevant son of God. In that name. Power was brokered. Power was sought and taken and exerted. Now, all of that's kind of depressing, isn't it? We look at some of the history of the church and we say, man, we're ashamed. We're ashamed of what people like us, good, well-intentioned people, brothers and sisters in the faith, we're ashamed with some of the things that they've done in the past or that even we're doing right now and we claim it in the name of Jesus. That's quite depressing. The undeniable fact that as human beings, good Christian men and women have fallen to the temptation to be relevant, have fallen to the temptation to be spectacular, and have ultimately fallen to the temptation to seize power and make change in the world. But there is good news to me, folks. There is great news. As we face these temptations, you and I have a Savior. His name is Jesus. We have a Savior who's conquered them and Satan himself. When he stood there, arms stretched out, nailed to the cross, his words at the end were, it is finished. Not it has begun. Not it has just started. Not well, it's kind of midway. It is finished. That has been won, the victory. We have good news today, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. You agree with me when I say that? Yes. He is standing next to us as we face the manifestations of these big three temptations. He's standing next to us and with us because he has faced them, and he won. He is providing us with leadership on how to overcome these temptations. He's with us, Emmanuel, God in the flesh. And he is relevant <coughs> enough. He is certainly powerful enough. He is the only one with the authority. The gospel covers all that bad news with the realization that God knows and has provided a way for us to overcome. So what makes the temptation of power so irresistible to us as humans then and now? And here's my answer. You know, I don't find this in the Bible. This is just a one-on-one according to Ryan. I think power is such a powerful Temptation because it is an easy substitute for the hard work of love. Power, seizing power, control, exerting it, is a really easy substitute for the hard work of loving someone who is very different than myself. It is the easy way out. As humans, we go for the easy way, right? We go for the way that seems simplest, not hardest. We're always looking. Okay. Just look at our language. Anybody agree with me? How much slang do we have? I've got a quicker way to say what I want to say. I don't want to get it all jumbled up with all those words. I'll just say some slang. And everybody will know what I mean, right? It's easy, it's quick. Texting language back when, you know, some of us had to learn how to text with the, with the best of them in T9. <laughs> You didn't just have a keyboard that you could put whatever letter you wanted. You had to hit each button three or four times to get to the right letter. And you only had 140 characters. So you had to break it down. You had to have abbreviations for everything. It was a whole new language, and it was easier. Power. 
offers an easy substitute to the hard work of love. I think that's our answer today. It's easier to be God than to love God, isn't it? It's easier to be judgmental than to let God handle the judgment, isn't it? It's easy for us to, easier for us to be God, to take that role, to say, I don't need to seek guidance from God. I know what I want to do. I'll make the decision for myself. It's easier to control people than to really love them right where they're at with all the baggage, all the stuff of life. It's easier to manipulate them and control them and hold them at arm's distance. It's easier to manipulate life than it is to love life. And this isn't a modern or postmodern struggle that we have, but all of a sudden, after years and years of humanity being on the earth, we just decided we we're going to go look for the easy way and to seek power. Jesus asks us, in a nutshell, at the end of his ministry on earth, do you love me? He's talking to the guy that betrayed him three times. And he says, Peter, I need to get you to the place where I am calling you to, to be a shepherd. Do you love me? And if our answer is yes, he says, feed my sheep. But in these discussions he has with his disciples, we really see their hearts. We see where their mind is at. My perfect example of this is in Mark chapter 10, and it happens in the other Gospels too, when uh, there's these two brothers, James and John, and they end up in one gospel asking Jesus, and in another one it's their mom asking Jesus, who's going to sit at the right hand of you, Jesus, when you enter your glory? In other words, who's the best? Who's the most powerful? Who will get the seat of honor? This is important. I need to know before you go. Will it be me? Will it be him? Will it be one of those other guys that it shouldn't even be? This has been going on for a long time, folks. In fact, if we look at all the way back to the beginning of the story, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, the serpent says some very powerful words. He says to Eve, the day you eat of this tree, your eyes will open and you will be like gods, knowing good from evil. That sounds kind of powerful, doesn't it? I'll have more information. I'll have knowledge. I will be like a god. That sounds pretty enticing. I wouldn't mind having that knowledge. All it takes is a little bite of that piece of fruit. It's almost too good to be true. It's been going on forever. It is why I think Satan saves that temptation of power for the very end. He started with it, and he's going to tempt Jesus with it as the last temptation. And boy, does he tempt us every day with power. We've been tempted from that time in Genesis all the way to this to replace love with power. That's it, folks. We have been tempted to replace love, the work of the gospel, with the easy substitution of power. Plain and simple, Jesus lived this temptation from the desert at the beginning of his ministry all the way to death on a cross. The long painful history of the church is the history of people always under the temptation to choose power over love. So you got here in the desert, Jesus is just beginning his ministry, and the final temptation Satan has for him is to be powerful. I will give you all these kingdoms if you'll just bow down to me. I've never understood that because you're talking to the Son of God who's been sitting on the throne from the beginning of time, and you're offering him this speck of creation, all the kingdoms of earth. It doesn't seem very powerful to me. But in my mind, in our minds, man, that's a lot. That's all we know, right? The kingdoms of earth. And you go all the way to the cross. And the taunting that Jesus faced. If you really are the Son of God, call down the angels. Save us from this brutal death that we are experiencing. Exert your power. Right? And Jesus says, get away from me, Satan. I am to worship God and God alone. 
and serve Him only. We've been tempted from the beginning of time all the way up to now to choose power over love, to choose control over the cross. And because of power and that temptation in our mind, we are tempted to be a leader over being led. Everybody wants to be a leader, right? You ever heard the explanation, too many chiefs and not enough Indians? Too many cooks in the kitchen? We got lots of cliches for it. And we all kind of laugh, especially in the church. But that allure, the temptation of being in the lead, is strong. It's so strong. We struggle being led, don't we? Each of us. Following. It's one of my weak parts. I, I'm not a, a good follower in a lot of things. I like being out in the lead. I like being the visionary, the dreamer, the stuff that hasn't even begun yet. That's where I like to be. And it's really hard not to grab onto that. I let go of Jesus. The temptation is to come up with all those great ideas for ministry, to come up with all those plans. And before you know it, you've set everything, the schedule, the sermons, the events, the ministry, and you haven't asked Jesus once, what would you do if I handed the church over to you? Where would you take us? Where would we go? The allure of power, of being led instead of leading, is strong. So if the temptation is to be relevant and spectacular, the question is, do you love me? And our task is to feed his sheep, then the challenge for us will be to go from <coughs> leading to being led. Our challenge is to go from leading the way to being led, following after after asking three times and commissioning Peter to be a shepherd instead of a professional fisherman, Jesus says this in John chapter 21, verse 18. In all truth, I tell you, when you were young, you put on your belt and walked where you liked. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and somebody else will put a belt around you and take you where you would rather not go. That doesn't sound very inviting, does it? Because we want freedom, don't we? We don't want someone telling us where we have to go, especially if it's where we'd rather not go. Well, I don't want somebody stringing a belt around me and saying, you're coming this way, whether you like it or not. It rubs us the wrong way, doesn't it? We want to be free. We want to make our own decisions. We want to be the king of the castle. Amen? The rest of you. You really want to be king of the castle. Of some castle. We all do. You see, the world's way of this passage is quite the reverse. We are taught that when we are young, we are dependent and not able to go and do what we want. If you're a parent, you may have heard this from your child at least a million times. Why don't I get to do what I want? You don't trust me. No, I don't. You never let your right, I don't. You know all those things, right? This is the way of the world. We're taught, all of us, that we're dependent when we're young, not independent. But Jesus just said, in all truth, I tell you, when you were young, you put on your belt and walked where you liked. Now we just kind of read that and go, hmm. But folks, this is truth. We've been kind of living this weird altered version. We're taught that when we're young, we're dependent, not able to go and do what we want. But when we get older, we will make our own decisions and go our own way. I cannot tell you how many times I've told my son, when you are 18 and not living under this roof, you can do what you want. You can spend your whole paycheck on Nerf guns and not eat for a month. You know, you can buy every Xbox game you want. I don't care. And not eat. Or be able to have gas. <laughs> or rent. But I want you to remember, we started this a couple weeks ago, re referencing Old Blue Eyes, 
Frank Sinatra, one of my favorite singers. And that song that he is famous for, I Did It My Way. And that is not our anthem. We don't want to end life singing, I did it my way. We want the reverse. Jesus tells us in this passage here that his way of maturity is viewed a bit differently. In Jesus' eyes, maturity is the ability and willingness, that's all caps, underlined, italicized. If you could put some other thing on there, I would encourage you to do it. A different color of ink, something to draw your attention. Because maturity in Jesus' eyes is the ability and the willingness to be led, not to lead. Where you would rather not go, but where God needs you to be. Maturity is the willingness, the ability and the willingness to be led where you would rather not go, but where God needs you to be. Immediately after commissioning Peter to be a shepherd and feed the sheep of God, Jesus confronts him with the harsh truth that the follower of Jesus, the servant leader, is being led to unknown, undesirable, and often painful places so that love and light and grace and mercy can be brought to a broken world. We don't want to go those places, do we? We don't want to go to painful places. We don't want to talk about painful things. But how else will light and love and the gospel of Jesus get there unless we go, unless we talk, unless we confront darkness? It's those undesirable places that Jesus is calling us to. It's those unlovable, undesirable people that Jesus wants us to relate to. And I got a, a little secret for you. If any of you are wondering, because if I say undesirable, unlovable people, I'm pretty sure that every one of you will come up with a picture in your head of someone that you know is unlovable or undesirable. But I want to let you in on this little secret. Somebody else is thinking about you. <laughs> we are all undesirable. We are all unlovable. Sinners saved by the grace of God through His Son, Jesus Christ, and His shed blood. Jesus is calling us to those people because He called someone to us. If you're a believer in Jesus, it's probably because somebody told you about him. It's probably because somebody exemplified his love and his mercy to you. It's because he called someone to be a part of your life. And at one point in that life of yours, you were probably pretty unlovable and pretty undesirable. Maybe even caused a little pain in the world around you. But Jesus loved you so much, he called somebody to share love and light in your dark area. And that's where he's calling each of us to encourage people to respond to him, right? That's our mission statement. He's calling us. The way of the follower of Jesus is not to climb a ladder to power and success, not a, not a corporate ladder, but rather a journey that culminates in the sacrifice on the cross. In our mind, success is going up. But ultimately, in the mind of Jesus, success really is coming low. It's not being first, it's being last. It's not being a leader, it's being a servant. We hear these stories, a lot of us, from the time that we were little kids in Sunday school, but it doesn't sink in. We say it. It's like we, we know it, but we don't live it. We're called to be servants. To go to those <coughs> undesirable places. Those that take up the cross of Jesus and are willing to be led by him, give up power and control for powerlessness and humility. And in doing this, Jesus is the one who is exalted, not us. That's my goal, folks. Two weeks ago I said that. I don't want to stand up here and tell you how relevant and spectacular I am. I want to point you to Jesus. It is my goal that down the road, 
when I'm gone from this church, that we don't say, you know, the kids that have come up in our adults now and in the church, we, we don't say, we, we don't look back and say, man, that season when Pastor Ryan was here, it was incredible. He did amazing things. No. Jesus. You remember when Jesus came and his Holy Spirit transformed our whole creation, all of us, our whole community. You remember that season when God moved among us. It was awesome. We want that. It's not us in the spotlight, it's Him that we're shining for. The challenge of changing direction from leading to being led by Jesus requires that we constantly and consistently give up power in favor of love. And it's hard work, folks. You know the saying, some of you may be uh, EGR. Anybody know what EGR is? EGR people? Extra grace required, people. Okay, so maybe you've got somebody in your life requires a little extra grace to be around. They bring turmoil. You know, they bring that something into every circle that they enter, you know. Well, here's a little secret again. You're an EGR person with somebody else. We all require God's grace. We all require His mercy. The challenge of changing direction means that we consistently and constantly give a power in favor of love. And love is hard. To love people, really love them right where they're at, and ask them to love us where we are, with all the stuff we bring into the relationship. It's hard work. I'm not telling any of us that we, in living a powerlessness and humble life, that would mean that we would be spineless, jellyfish-ish. That we are to let people walk all over us and make every decision for us. That's not what I'm saying at all. The life that Jesus is calling us to, one that gives up power and chooses love, refers to a life of a person who is so deeply in love with Jesus that they're ready to go wherever he says. They're ready to do whatever he asks. And they're ready to say whatever he wants. Wherever he guides, always trusting that Jesus, walking step in step with us, is bringing abundant and fullness of life. So much so that we just can't ever leave that place. And wherever Jesus goes, we have to go. Because that's where life is. It takes a lot of discipline, doesn't it? My daughter said earlier, you know, the place that she feels unsafe and out of control is when she's in trouble and being disciplined. But I'm not referring to that. I'm reminding you again for the third week in a row. I'm reminding you it's a discipline, a work, or something that we do habitually. The discipline is theological reflection. The discipline that helps us resist the power of tempta the temptation of power and the power of is theological reflection. And some of you are probably going, what? What's that? Theological reflection, it, it sounds like a big word. Most of us, if not all of us, we, we just don't think this way anymore. What I mean by this is that we don't think with the mindset of Christ. Many of us. We, all of us tend to think the worldly first and then match up God's word, word with what we know and what the world tells us. So when we read God's word, and it's confusing, we think of worldly applications and try to put God's word in an earthly box. Instead of saying, how different is God? And let me ask him first. What does he mean by that? Because it may not have anything to do with the worldly circumstances. It may match up, but to not constrain God to an earthly, definable box. To let God speak for himself first. This is the way Jesus did it. His response in this, back to chapter 4, to this temptation of power is, Get away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Not serving worldly things, but worshiping God and serving him only. 
when presented with all these temptations, Jesus goes to the heart of God first. He quotes scripture. He goes to Dad and says, Dad, what do you think about this? And he gets his answer. And then he uses that answer. He doesn't go to God second. He doesn't go to God third. He definitely doesn't wait until every other avenue is exhausted and then ask God. He, he goes first. This is hard stuff, folks. How many of you go to God first every single time? <coughs> Nobody? Well, I don't either. My arm's out trying to model, you know. We struggle at being led, don't we? We want to do things on our own. When we're presented with choices and opportunities, do we measure them up in the world, with the world, how it will benefit us, our family, a list of pros and cons? Or do we approach it with the mindset of Christ, studying God and how he has interacted with humanity over its whole existence and allowing God to lead us and be our primary influence? We have a tool for the past 300 years or so. John Wesley gave it to us, the father of Methodism. We claim a lot of his theology in the Church of the Nazarene, his understanding of who God is and how God interacts with us. And he never coined this phrase, but it's the Wesleyan quadrilateral. And some of you are probably going, are we in math class? I'm horrible at math. And there's over there going, yes, we're talking about that. That's not what we're talking about. The Wesleyan quadrilateral. Uh, thinking about God first, having a, a mindset of Christ first, dealing with the world, finding out if what we're doing is what God wants us to do. How do we do that? And there's four things that Wesley says we ought to do. We start with Scripture. We go to God's Word because this is the heart of God. And then the other three, they're kind of supporting links. We don't go to them first. We go to Scripture first. But then the other three are tradition. You know, the tradition of the Church of the Nazarene is pretty good. It is full of people, and people are fallible. But it's pretty good. We've done some incredible things in the Church of the Nazarene. Since 1949, we've raised $100 million to build buildings through alabaster offerings. When you get enough people together, man, you can accomplish a lot with the God's help and His grace. But we look at those things and say, awesome. The tradition of the Church of the Nazarene and these things, it doesn't measure up with those. The tradition of the church overall, the church universal. What has the church done in the past? Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. We saw those pictures earlier. Sometimes the things that the church has done, and traditionally done, aren't the greatest. So then we go back to scripture. When tradition doesn't seem to match up with what we're thinking we ought to do, we go to scripture and say, was that tradition right? If it was, okay, we got some more emphasis. If it wasn't, well, Scripture over that overrules that, supersedes it, so we just stick to Scripture. We've got reason. Is it reasonable? You're all pretty got, got pretty good heads on your shoulders, and you can tell what's reasonable and what's not reasonable, right? So we use the brain that God blessed us with, and we say, is it reasonable to do this? Does it make sense? Or does this just not match up? When we have questions in reason, we go back to Scripture, and we say, what does God's Word say about this? Is it reasonable or not? And the last part is experience. What have I experienced in my life through brothers and sisters? What have I uh, been witness to by the folks in the church? And if I don't have a lot of experience in the church, I might go to somebody like Papa Dan. And say, Papa Dan, you've had so many experiences in the church. You've seen God move in so many ways. Would you explain this to me? I've got this puzzling question. Could you talk with me about it? Someone with experience. And then we combine that with scripture again. So you got four things. Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. If you feel like you're in a, in a new class, this, we have to have tools, folks. We have to know how to do things God's way. And we need to know whether what we're doing is God's way or not. And this is a really good tool that tells us. The Wesleyan Quadrilateral. It helps us immensely with the discipline of theological reflection and also with handing over to Jesus the role of leader that is rightfully his. Handing over to God. If we're always going to Scripture, we're giving that authority to God. So 
This is my question to you. Are you ready to give up power and to choose love? That's a big decision to make. Some of you might say, I've been doing that. Yeah, well, that's awesome. Tomorrow morning when you get up, remind yourself, I can give up power today. I'm going to choose love. Some of you may say, I'm not ready to do that yet. That's a really hard thing to do. Okay, I'll pray with you, and you pray for me. Because it's a struggle for every single one of us to give up power and choose love every day. My wife told me before service started, she was traveling down the road on the way here to the building. And uh, she's on Road 68. It's kind of icy out, right? So she's going kind of slow, 35 miles an hour. Not so slow that they're really holding up traffic because it's people it's morning, you know? But there's a guy right on her tail. And he decides he's going to pass, which he wants power. And he's got power in that big truck that he's in. So he guns it and he gets up next to her and, and they're now parallel side by side and he realizes, hey, there's a car driving the other way. Maybe I ought not to be doing this. I wonder if he asked God first, God, should I pass this lady who's going incredibly slow? Even though she wasn't? And then, what happens if we're in that situation? If you're in that car with my wife, what happens? Fear? You know, I'm out of control now. This guy's going to take my life and the life of my kids in the car. So I'm going to get angry at him. I'm going to throw my hands up and look in the mirror and say, Seriously? <laughs> really? What do you think you're doing? It's hard to choose love over power. That's just a little comical example. But that's also to show you it happens every single day. In little circumstances, the opportunity to choose power or not, the opportunity to choose love or not. So the first temptation for Jesus and all of us was that relevance. The second is to be spectacular. And the third is power. And the question that Jesus asks us, do you love me? If the answer is yes, then our task is then to feed his sheep. And our challenge is to go from leading doing it our way, to being led and doing it God's way. The first discipline that we talked about was being in God's Word. If we are to do God's will, we need to know what it is. And so we go to His Word. The second discipline we use is the cycle of confession and forgiveness. Making sure that we're right with God. Confessing and openly with each other so that we have real authentic relationship. And then the ability to forgive and ask forgiveness from people. And the third is theological reflection. To go to God first. Because we don't just want to know the heart of God by reading His Word. We don't want to just confess our own sins and seek and offer forgiveness. But we also have a desire, all of us, to be an instrument and to do something. So we have to do what God's asking us to do. It's what brings us life. It's what brings us joy. We live in a world of temptations, don't we? Satan is seeking to pull us away from the will of God and to keep us from accomplishing our task of bringing love and light into a world that desperately needs God. But the good news is we have a leader, a good shepherd, if you will, uh, one who knows the way, the one who leads, and his name is Jesus. He alone is the way to everlasting life, full of joy and peace. So my challenge to you is to trade. Trade being relevant and spectacular for following Jesus. Trade the illusion of power, lay it down, and all the trappings that come with it, and allow God to lead the way. Because he's the one with the plan. He's the one that has all the information that we know. His way works, doesn't it? His way works, doesn't it? I've seen it time and time again. So that is my challenge for you. We've got a big year ahead of us. And we have lots of temptations ahead of us. They will not go away, this side of Jesus coming back. But be encouraged about the good news. Jesus conquered Satan. He beat temptation. And he is empowering us to do the same. 
We don't have to succumb to temptation. We don't have to give in to sin. As followers of Jesus, we are free from that bondage forevermore. We can still choose to do it, but why? Why choose to do that when it sucks joy and life out of us? When God's way brings joy and life. In a minute, I'm going to ask the uh, couple of the guys who I've talked with about preparing to bring our, our uh, Holy Communion. And I want to give you an opportunity to pray as we do that. We're going to uh, sing a song together. We're going to have uh, three different places where you can come and gather the elements for communion. I'm going to ask that you hold on to them. And uh, as you go back to your seat, we, when we finish that, we will all partake together. So uh, as they come, and as the music people come, I want you to pray with me. Okay? Father God, we've been talking over these past three weeks about these temptations that your son faced. The temptation to be uh, relevant in the world. The temptation to be spectacular in this world. The temptation that power brings to us. And Father God, we thank you that in Jesus Christ we have found a leader. A leader who conquered Satan. A leader who we can follow. We want to come right now, God, and remember what Jesus has done for us, what he is still doing for us. We ask, God, that you would prepare our hearts and our minds. We ask that you would bless, God, that you would bring your Holy Spirit. And that in the act of taking this little piece of bread and this cup of juice, your grace would flow through us, Pray your blessing upon the elements as they signify the broken body of Jesus Christ and his shed blood, the atonement that sets us free from the bondage of sin and death. Help us to remember what you've done for us. May your kingdom come. May Jesus come soon. Pray it in his name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand, and if you go out your row to the right, come receive the elements, and enter your row from the left. So you make a loop. You have a station in front of each section of chairs. And when you are ready, come and receive the elements. And we will partake together when everyone has this room. On the night when he was betrayed, First, gathered around the table with his brothers. They shared a meal together, Passover feast. And when the time came, he took a loaf of bread and he broke it and he said, This is my body broken for you. So I want you to take that little piece of bread and break it. And let's remember Jesus' broken body and what he's done.
Let's sing one more song, folks. Let's sing it out loud. His peace and his grace flow through you. You are dismissed.